All right. So, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about bread today. And uh, what I've chosen for you is a recipe that is very straightforward and, uh, and a, pretty, a pretty easy recipe to do. So it's going to be called, what we'll, what we'll call it is our basic artisan bread. And the idea here is we want a bread that's going to look like something that has a little bit of a crust. It's going to be the type of bread that you might find at a bakery, but it's something you can do at home without a bunch of crazy techniques. Once you get a little crazy, you can start using things like sourdough. And with a sourdough starter, you're pretty much unlimited when it comes to bread. So this is sort of the next step after you master what we're doing today. Um, I'll put that aside. What we're doing today, instead of a sourdough starter, is using regular yeast. And you can really use any type of yeast for this. I've got two types here. This is your active dry yeast, and this is your instant yeast. The difference is this will just work a lot faster, and you use a little bit less of it. So if this is the yeast that you're working with, and, and those of you that are doing those packets of yeast, just look at the packet to tell you if it's instant or active dry. If it's active dry, you can just use that whole packet. That packet is about two and a quarter teaspoons. If it's instant, you're gonna only use a quarter teaspoon of that packet. So, when we go to make our bread, the first thing that we need to consider is the flour that we're using for the bread. And when you consider the flour that you're using, you're actually using, I'll kind of bring it up here close so you can kind of see it, you're using what's called a wheat berry. And that wheat berry is actually what you get when you have that big kind of flowing grains of wheat growing in the field. If you were to take that wheat and just kind of press it in your hands like this, you would get several of these wheat berries. The wheat berries, though small, have three parts to them. The first part is called the endosperm. The endosperm is where you get white flour. So when you go to the store and you see all-purpose or white flour, what that is is the endosperm of the wheat. The second part is the bran. You've probably heard of bran before, like bran cereal or bran flakes. Bran is simply the name for that outer covering of the wheat berry. The third is called the germ. The germ is actually where all the nutrients are. It's like a little oil gland inside this little wheat berry. So when you go to the store and buy white all-purpose flour, what they've done is they've ground this, then they've removed the bran and the germ so that all you have is the endosperm. So there are many different types of flour out there. There's your bread flour, there's your all-purpose flour, there's your whole wheat flour, and then others. So what I've got here is a grinder that will actually grind these wheat berries and make what is traditionally called your whole wheat flour. So what I'm gonna do is turn this on, And what I've done is I've turned those wheat berries into just your basic flour. So this would be a true whole wheat flour. It has the bran, it has the germ, it has the endosperm. It's a great flour to use, but it's not always a friendly flour to use. With the bread we're making today, you wouldn't want to use this kind of flour. If you do use this kind of flour, what would actually happen is the bread wouldn't rise the way that you want it to. So the bread we're making today, I'm recommending either a bread flour or an all-purpose. I've got a couple here. This one's your bread flour, this one's your all-purpose. The main difference is the amount of protein. Your all-purpose is going to have about 8% protein, this one's going to have about 14%. So we're going to start by taking our flour and getting about three cups. So those of you who are doing this along with me, you're going to go ahead and need to find some flour, find a bowl, and find a cup measurement. Now when we go to do this, you could also do it by weight. <clears throat> Once you get really into the bread making process, it's all about measuring the ingredients by weight. We're not gonna get that involved today. Today is about the simplicity of making the bread itself. So a cup measurement is gonna be perfect for this. So I always use a knife just to kind of toss the flour around a little bit, otherwise it packs down. So I'm just gonna stir my flour around. Then, I'm going to reach in to grab my cup, I'm going to level it off with a knife into the bowl. One cup, two cups, and finally, three cups. And that is it. Your flour is done, and that's really the most important part of this whole process. So I'm going to set my flour aside. I've got my bowl here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add two more ingredients to this. 
You can make any type of primary artisan bread using your four main ingredients. Your flour, your yeast, your salt, and your water. That's pretty much it. Those four things will take care of your bread. Now, when you get into breads that have butter or egg or milk or sugar, it makes it a little bit different. But we've got three cups of flour. Now what we're going to do is add our salt. The salt that we're going to be adding today is either sea salt or kosher salt. You don't want to add the table salt because that's not really a good salt for this. It's got iodine in it. I'm going to add a teaspoon and a quarter of salt. So if you have your kosher salt, if you have your sea salt, go ahead and measure out a teaspoon and then about a fourth of that teaspoon into your bowl. Okay, we've got three cups of flour. We've got our teaspoon and a quarter of salt. Now for the yeast. If I was using the active dry, I would add a bit more, but I'm gonna use this instant yeast. One little tip is to store your yeast in the fridge. I even store mine in the freezer sometimes, but if you store it in the fridge, you actually extend the life. This yeast is in a state of what we call dormancy. And as a state of dormancy, this yeast is actually sleeping. So what we're going to do is try to wake this yeast up. Now you could do that one of two ways. You could actually get really close to the yeast and just say, wake up! The other thing that you could do is add a little bit of water to it. And that's gonna be our technique because the yeast does not like to be yelled at. It's kind of like many of you students who now are sleeping until 11.30 a.m. or noon. In fact, I had a student miss my 1.30 p.m. Zoom call yesterday because he was still asleep. So you might not need that kind of wake-up call. Our yeast doesn't. Our yeast is going to require a fourth of a teaspoon. Now that doesn't seem like much, but because it's instant yeast, it's pretty crazy. So a fourth of a teaspoon into our bowl. That concludes what we're gonna call our dry ingredients. <clears throat> so those of you following along, three cups of flour, teaspoon and a quarter of salt, quarter teaspoon of yeast. Now all I'm gonna do is stir it up. I'm mixing it all up together, all the dry ingredients. Your job in making this bread is about 50% done. So again, that's how easy this process is. So I'm stirring it up. Now, I'm gonna add water. And this is where it gets a little tricky because the amount of water is gonna be different for everybody. So <clears throat> if you're using a white flour, like an all-purpose flour that's really fine, you're gonna end up adding more water than the people who are using a heavier bread flour. So here's what I'm gonna have you do. Keep this number in the back of your mind, a cup and a half. That's a really good base number to work with. But I'm gonna do it by sight and show you what it's supposed to look like. So I've got some water here. The water can be room temperature or cool. It does not have to be hot. You don't need to heat the water up for this recipe. This is a slow rise recipe. So I'm gonna take my water and right now I've got a little over a cup and a half. I'm gonna pour, oh, about maybe a cup or so of that water in. And then using a spoon or a fork, I'm just gonna stir that up. Now, as I'm stirring, you'll notice that it's still pretty dry. There's still a lot of flour in there. It's not really incorporated, so I know I need more water. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour some more water in. Again, cup and a half is kind of my goal. I'm gonna stir this around. And what we're looking for is a dough that is called <clears throat> shaggy. Shaggy in that it's not soupy and it's not super firm. It's kind of right in that middle area. And you're gonna look at this and think, that's not how bread dough is supposed to look. And you would be correct for any recipe other than the one that we're using. A Little more water and it's just about there. So I'm just about at the cup and a half mark. I'm using an all-purpose flour instead of a bread flour. So I'm actually gonna add a tiny bit more water because with that all-purpose flour, it actually absorbs a tiny bit less. If I was doing bread flour, I might add a little bit more. Okay, so what we've got here is the shaggy consistency. 
It's just kind of a gloopy mess. That is actually what you want. You don't want a firm dough. If you have a firm dough, you need to add a little bit more water. Now, <clears throat> let's say you panic and you add too much water. Easy solution. Throw more flour in. You're just going for this overall consistency of a shaggy dough. So once again, there it is, the shaggy dough. Now, this particular recipe is a no knead, K-N-E-A-D. So you don't need to sit here and rub this around and do a bunch of different things with it. That bread for this step is actually done. So what I'm going to do, let me go ahead and grab one here, is I'm gonna put a plastic covering over this bread. <clears throat> I kind of cheat and use these um, shower caps. And that way I can reuse this and I don't have to go through a bunch of plastic wrap. So get, get yourself like a little shower cap, preferably an unused shower cap, and go ahead and throw that over your bread. This bread is now going to sit, forget this, 12 to 18 hours. That sounds crazy. Now, it's especially annoying if you're in the mood for bread right now, because this is a long game. So this bread is just gonna go on your countertop for about you know, 12 hours. Just set a timer on your phone. So if you're making it at 7 p.m. the night before, then just know that at 7 a.m. or any time between 7 a.m. and you know, 1 p.m., you need to come deal with this bread. Now, it's just gonna sit there, and if you stare at it long enough, you'll start to lose your mind because nothing will seem like it's happening. But a lot is actually happening in this bread. The yeast have woken up. The yeast will begin to consume the sugars in the wheat. And as they consume those sugars, they will then begin releasing carbon dioxide, which is gonna cause little bubbles on the surface. <clears throat> About 18 hours ago, I did that same process with this. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you kind of close up you're gonna see bubbles and kind of a stringy-like look. See that stringy kind of look there? It's a very wet kind of look. That is the sort of look you're going for. Again, this has been about 18 hours. Now again, this is a sticky, shaggy dough, but that is okay. That's what we want. So once you get to that timer, kind of wipe my finger off here. Once you get to that, that time, you are ready for the next step. The next step is a tiny bit more complicated than the first step, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you what it looks like because you really have nothing to worry about. <clears throat> and to illustrate that, I'm gonna show you a finished product in two different styles, so you'll see there really is nothing to worry about. But when that time is up, the easiest thing for you to do is to clear your countertop and then to go ahead and grab yourself some flour. So I'm gonna take a little container with some of my all-purpose flour. And I'm gonna lightly sprinkle my countertop because this dough is gonna be very sticky. I'm gonna take the dough and I'm actually gonna grab, uh, let me look back here for one. I'm gonna grab a, just a little scoop, a little spatula to get it out. And I'm gonna dump this onto the counter. You'll see, well, Turn this a little bit for you. You'll see that it's just a very kind of gloopy mess, but that's okay because you've got some flour to work with and what you're gonna do is flip this dough a few times. So what I'm gonna do using my spatula, using my dough scraper, I'm just flipping the dough over on itself and as I do, I'm gonna lightly sprinkle a little bit more flour. Flip the dough, flip the dough, and then flour. Now, I've flipped it a few times. I'm actually now going to flip it over on itself. The top is called the seam side because you'll see the seam from where I flipped the dough. So I'm gonna take that and just flip it over on itself. And I would normally let this rest for about 15 minutes. Now, I'm gonna tell you where to find the recipe for this just so you don't have to write all this down and remember all this, but I'm gonna let that rest because I just gave that dough kind of a workout. It had done all this rising really slowly and then I just started flipping it around and it didn't like that very much. But after that rest, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes, 
I am now ready to try to make a little bit of a ball out of this dough. Now, if this part doesn't work, don't freak out, your dough's not ruined. If you end up with something that doesn't even look like a ball, it will still work in some way, shape, or form. What I'm gonna do is flour my hands, flour the dough, and I'm just going to begin folding it up a little bit. And as I fold it, I'm pinching so that it stays closed. Then, get a little more flour because it'll be very sticky. I'm just gonna begin moving it around like this on the counter. The edges will become a little sticky, which is fine. Moving it around until it forms a little bit of a circle shape. Now, again, with a dough like this, yours may not be this wet because you may have added a little less water or it may be even more wet, you may have added more water. The point is, you're just shaping your dough. And as you shape it, you're increasing the surface tension on the dough so that you get a nice, cute little ball of dough like that. And that's it. Now you wait again. I'm telling you, this is a long game recipe, but there's not much that you have to worry about from this because it's a pretty easy recipe. But you give this another two hours. And what I like to do is take a cloth that you have floured really well and lay it over that dough for about two hours. You don't want it to dry out. When that two hours is up, or actually let's say an hour and a half into that, you need to start thinking about how you're actually going to bake this bread. Now, the baking of the bread is what is going to make it artisan bread for you. Artisan bread has a nice crust that when you break into it has that crackling sound, and that's what we want. We get that by cooking the bread inside of something. So I've got a couple options for you. This one is probably the thing that you actually have on hand right now. A Dutch oven or a French oven. It has to be really sturdy and have a lid and be oven safe. I've got another one over here, just a slightly different style, different look, but same idea. It's oven safe and it has a lid. Here's why you want this. That bread, as it cooks, is going to release moisture. And if you capture that moisture, it will keep your bread moist and enable it to be more delicious. If you don't capture that moisture, and if I just put this bread on a sheet tray, it wouldn't be as good. Now, <clears throat> don't panic. If you don't have one of these, there is a secret. You cook the bread on a sheet tray, and under the sheet tray, you put a pan with hot water. Then as it cooks, there's water in your oven that's creating steam. What you do is you put the bread in here after the oven is hot. And while the oven is heating up, this is in the oven. So the secret is the bread is going directly into a hot oven and then into a hot oven. It's a double oven, more or less. So <clears throat> I know that my bread has to rest for two hours. I'm gonna set my timer for 90 minutes. When that timer goes off, this goes in the oven, and I set that oven to 450 degrees. When the two hours is up, I take this out. I got these little um, oven-proof gloves that make that job a lot easier, but if you're using towels, just be very careful because this is hot. I take the lid off. I go to grab that dough. When you grab that dough, you're gonna panic. It's gonna to stick to the counter. It's gonna to stick to the towel. You're gonna to think you ruined it. You did not ruin it. You can't ruin this bread. You could just grab this dough and slap it in here and it would be fine. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna grab the dough. I'm not actually gonna pick this one up because this one's still resting. You're gonna grab it and you're just gonna place it inside the bowl. Boom. When you do, it's gonna go splat into that bowl. All you have to do is put the lid back on and put it in the oven. You're not greasing the bowl, you're not putting butter in the bowl, you're not putting flour in the bowl, you're just dropping that bread. There's two parts to the bake. This goes in the oven for about 30 minutes. And that when that 30 minutes is up, <clears throat> you take the lid off and you cook it for another 20. What that does, the 30 minutes causes it to rise 
the last 20 causes it to get a crust. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that you, can, you can't mess this bread up. So to illustrate that, I'm gonna show you the first loaf that I did earlier today. And when I did this loaf, <clears throat> I just dropped this bread straight in here. I just let it splat inside of here. It just sort of fell out of my hands and it went all over the place. And this was the finished product. Now, is it beautiful? No, but does it have a nice crust? Yes, and I want you just to listen to this. That's a beautiful sound and we love that sound. And this is a really good bread. In fact, I don't have a knife to cut it, so I'm just gonna tear it open for you. You'll see the inside, there are those nice pockets of air where the, the yeast rose and everything. And you could eat this as it is. You could serve it with some olive oil as a dipping sauce. You could even make sandwiches out of this. The second loaf, I put in a little more carefully. And I put it in because I wanted it to get a slightly darker color and of a more round look. So with this one, I just kind of gently placed it in there. And as a result, it gave it a little bit of a rounder look and not quite as, you know, shaped like this. But the point is, you can't mess it up because you're going to get good bread regardless. And you're going to get bread that looks like the kind of bread you might buy from a store. And you made it in a total amount of your time of probably about 25 minutes of work. And that includes finding the flour and the measuring cups. The rest of that time is just you being patient and waiting. This is a bread that rewards patience. And a lot of breads do. But that's the gist of it. So you're gonna need your flour, your yeast, your salt, and your water. You're gonna need some time on your hands and some planning, but all of us pretty much have time on our hands now because we're all stuck at home. So you might as well try some of these bread techniques. That's it, people. 